Again, for those of you who are just dialing in, I'm Lothar, I'm the CEO of Maxim EGI. And I would like to welcome you to the Maxim Academy today. And we'll give it another minute and then we get started. So I suggest we get started. Again, I'm Lothar, I'm the CEO of Maxim EGI, and I'm excited uh, that we can offer you another Maxim Academy. Today, we will hear from Dion Dumas, uh, and uh, we will uh, have an introduction here in a minute. But uh, before we do this, I would like to make sure that you understand that at Maxim EGI, we always want to operate at the highest scientific and ethical standards. So please uh, pay attention to this statement. The scientific content remains the intellectual property of the audit, uh, authors. This webinar is sponsored and organized by Maxim EGI. However, Maxim EGI does not engage in generating or editing scientific content presented. Inclusion in this webinar should not be taken as an endorsement of scientific findings by Maxim EGI. Please note the use of Maxim EGI devices for, for other than the clear intended use is considered investigational. So with no further ado, um, um, Trey will introduce Guillaume uh, here in a minute, but I just want, I'm, want to tell you on a personal note, uh, and I've said this before in this academy, we at Maxim EGI want to go where the science takes us. Obviously, the science will eventually result in possibly clinical applications, which is why we try to stay so close to the research. And today, we will really hear about the frontier in brain research. We're moving away from just studying individual brains of individuals or patients to two or three or entire groups of brains interacting with each other in a social setting. So we're moving really into the social application of brain science. And you can just imagine how the next step then is not uh, 10 or 100 people interacting with each other, but entire groups and societies interacting with each other, which gets us to a very hot topic with a lot of hype these days, AI. We like to think of it more as machine learning. And we are committed as Maxim EGI to work with those of you in the field that are interested in machine learning so we can extract useful information for researchers and clinicians uh, because these data sets uh, will be increasingly become available to neuroscientists. So Trey, if you uh, would take it from here, that would be great. Thanks, Altar, uh, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm excited uh, to share this continuation of the uh, Maxim EGI Academy and welcome uh, Guillaume Dumas, uh, who is an assistant professor of computational psychiatry and faculty of medicine at the University of Montreal. Uh, we are very excited in North America to have him recently across the pond from, from France. Uh, and he is an active de developer in the world of EEG research, most recently releasing HiPipe, a Python-based software for the study of inner brain connectivity measures. Uh, methodologically, Dr. Dumas is at the, at the crossroads of social psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and systems biology. He uses the neuroimaging technique, uses neuroimaging techniques such as EEG hyperscanning, where you can record from multiple subjects. Um, and this allows them to invest, investigate relationships between coordination uh, at both neural, behavioral, and social levels. Uh, I think one of the way the way I, I met him was actually in his uh, role in the intersection of neuroscience and art. Um, and one of the projects that I became familiar with uh, was the Dream Sessions, um, in which he collaborated with an artist uh, at 
our um, office in Eugene uh, to collect 101 nights of 256 channel um, sleep recordings on the same subject and explore possibilities for interacting with and understanding sleep and dreaming. And as part of this project, Dr. Duma and his uh, collaborators developed a Python uh, data importer for our data, as well as open source sleep staging, uh, open source sleep stage detection tool um, for the Magstim EGI uh, high density system, which um, was a welcome development in the, in the open source world. So uh, this has been a long time in the making, and um, I'm very excited to share uh, share his work because I think this really he is a driving force in making hyperscanning a, a, a rigorous and really meaningful field. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, so let me share now the screen. Thank you for inviting me to share some uh, developments about hyperscanning. So today I will present a bit first half of the, <clears throat> the session going to be focused on more like uh, theoretical considerations, specifically uh, historical and uh, methodological uh, aspects of hyperscanning. So uh, I called the, the talk H exponent four for hyperscanning history, hype and hope. Um, and well, uh, it's funny because last time we met with Trey, it was at INSAR in Montreal. And so now I'm uh, working in Montreal at the Chu Saint Justine, where I starting uh, my laboratory. Uh, and um, I'm going to present some of the results. So like a lot of people helped in, in the, the results that I'm going to show, but I wanted to specifically thank my uh, new team uh, in Montreal, so the Precision Psychiatry and Social Physiology team. And today we're going to speak about social physiology and how we can study uh, interacting brains using hyperscanning. So as a disclaimer, hyperscanning is not, uh, I, I won't talk about the Mattel console hyperscan. If you have like a, some automated alerts uh, for a web page on the internet, for hyperscanning, you end up with a lot of uh, announcement regarding this console. I won't speak about that. But uh, as a historical uh, introduction, uh, it's funny because um, recently uh, it was um, cited in the New York Times. Uh, the, the whole field of multi-brain recording started with power psychology. And there were like a science paper in 1965 uh, pretending to uh, have demonstrated uh, uh, extrasensory uh, induction, so like a telepathy basically, uh, using hyperscanning with like one figure and a two line abstract. And that can show that you can do multiple brain recording and publish uh, noise. So, so also it could have been in the section hype, but uh, it's historically where it begins. But the terminology hyperscanning per se come from scanning and so from fMRI and it's uh, coined by Reed Montague in 2002 where they were like doing multiple brain recording using uh, scanners, so fMRI. Uh, then quickly the EG community uh, catched up with the, this idea of multiple brain recording and especially for instance, the team of uh, uh, Claudio Babiloni and Fabio Babiloni in Roma, where they used uh, four EG recording while uh, people were playing cards. And uh, in the US uh, at Boca Raton, Florida, uh, the team of Scott Kelso with Emmanuel Tonioli and Julian Lagarde uh, did also hyperscanning EEG in the case of uh, spontaneous interaction of motor coordination, where they were able to demonstrate that there were like specific signature in the EEG that were related to the active coordination uh, at the social level with others. And interestingly, 2005 at the Society for Neuroscience in a poster, uh, Emmanuel Tonioli shared this kind of idiosyncratic observation of interbrain synchronization in their data set, uh, calling it idiosyncratic because it was not like statistically robust enough at that time. And uh, kind of 
hard to capture in the essence. But interestingly, in 2009, uh, the team of um, Lindelberger in Berlin was able to show uh, statistically the robustness of those interbrain synchronization in the case of pairs of guitarists playing the same uh, music. And so in that case, uh, kind of demonstrating that uh, it can be assessed quantitatively, the, those interbrain synchronization, um, and that there is a, a world framework uh, that can be done uh, at the statistical level to assess those interbrain synchronization. Well, uh, in my case, uh, at the time I was starting a PhD uh, with Jacqueline Nadel, who kind of uh, developed behavioral hyperscanning, so to say, uh, as a developmental psychologist, uh, recording uh, the behavior of uh, mother infants using dual video system. And interestingly, without having brain activity recorded, was showing the importance of fine tuned dynamics during social interaction, showing that, for instance, uh, a, a kids of three months old is able to, to separate a video of, of her or his mother in real time or pre-recorded. So it means like at three months old, we are already uh, able to decipher which is like the, the little dynamics that takes place in interaction uh, at the nonverbal way. And so what we did uh, at that time uh, with uh, another lab, more in uh, neuroimaging and, and neurodynamics is to use a dual EG system on top of the dual video system to, uh, to analyze what's going on between two people interacting uh, in a nonverbal way and uh, in two Faraday cages. And through the synchronization of the amplifier for the EG, we were able to uh, investigate what's going on during those uh, fine grain uh, nonverbal spontaneous interaction. And it went through uh, some uh, difficult uh, aspects such as the behavioral analysis, which has to be done frame by frame because the, the interaction were not scripted. It was spontaneous uh, dyadic interaction. So with turn taking and we analyzed frame by frame uh, who was imitating who and if the movement were synchronized or not. And uh, it take like 11 months uh, to do that. Uh, here is a, a representation of the video of what's going on. So like that's the, the software we use to analyze frame by frame uh, the interaction. So at the beginning, uh, people were just doing resting state separated in their two Faraday cages. They don't see each other yet. Then they start moving their hands and don't see each other still, like the, 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 the screen in front of them is blank. It's like control condition to show how much the brain becomes uh, similar doing the same task. And now uh, after the LED synchronization, uh, they see each other. So there, there's like a video in front of them with a, a camera filming their end movement and the participant on the left see the movement of the participant on the right and this vice versa. And at the bottom, you see the frame by frame analysis of synchronization, imitation, and who is driving the interaction uh, of the imitation. And so you can see that there is this turn taking emerging with like one participant imitating the end movement of the other, then it stop and uh, the other one take the lead and so on. And using this kind of analysis, we were able to uh, first show that most of the time, they were both synchronized and imitating. But uh, overall, the synchronization of movement, so the, the fact of doing the same uh, pace of the movement, not necessarily doing the same movement itself. So I take often the, uh, the example of a jazz band, like everyone is playing a different instrument, so they are not doing the same movement. But they are, when they are jamming, uh, doing the, their movement, their respective movement, at the same pace in, in the same dynamic. So that's what synchrony is about. And so synchrony seems like even more present than imitation because you can have also synchronization of behavior without even noticing. Like uh, if you walk in the, in the metro, you can sometimes see people synchronizing their walking without even noticing that they are entrained to the environment and the other people walking around them. Uh, 
at first, what we show is also that uh, at the intra-individual level, before going to the inter-brain and inter-individual level, we were able to disentangle different um, aspects of agency, so like uh, attribution of intention uh, of the movement or uh, ownership of the ongoing action by using different contrasts. So like when we compare movement of hands without resting state compared to resting state or where sub, uh, participant one was imitating participant two versus he was just moving without taking into account the other and so on. So only um, with this kind of uh, paradigm, we are able already at the intrabrain level to uh, disentangle various aspects of social cognition that are not easily uh, reachable uh, with traditional uh, paradigm. But the most important thing is that we can have also uh, an impact on the context and the role you are taking in the interaction to show that if first the, um, the fact of uh, being engaged in an interaction is already different from perceiving spectatorially, like detached uh, from a, a video of an interaction, for instance, when you are actively engaged in interaction, your brain is acting differently. That's, so that's one first big uh, take home message. And so like, that's why those kind of hyperscanning experiment are important because you can study the brain in interaction. But also the thing is that beyond even the difference between social perception and social interaction, there are different flavor, different uh, aspects of social interaction that can be uh, disentangled with proper experimental design. So for instance, the, the fact of saying participant one imitate participant two uh, in a forced induced way. So that's the, the bottom part of the, the slide is different from the spontaneous interaction where we say to the both participants, continue to move your hands and imitate the other whenever you want. Where like here, it's more like a, a, a turn-taking based interaction. And depending on if you are imitator or model, it's also change. So, well, that's like at the intra brain level. And the, the most uh, surprising and uh, uh, based on uh, those recording, uh, the, the discovery of uh, inter brain synchronization was uh, even more uh, uh, staggering and surprising. So it took a while to, to get it published. But what we showed is that in, in line with what uh, Lindenberger group uh, shown with the pair of guitarists, but in their case, they were entrained by a common metronome. So the, the pace was imposed from the exterior. Here we show that just by interacting socially, people can attune themselves to the other, like being the, the stimulus of the other person and vice versa, and converge on this state of interbrain synchronization without an external uh, metronome. And we show that uh, between the two brains, the, 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 the frequency band that was the most robustly involved in those interbrain synchronization were the alpha band and uh, the, the brain region that seems like the hub of synchronization is the right parietal in the case of nonverbal interaction. And so that was one of the, the, the first paper on that. And uh, we then replicated with different type of interactions, for instance, in language with uh, my colleague Alexandre Perez, uh, but also with uh, affective touch uh, in, in this case of um, the, the beautiful study of uh, Pavel Goldstein with uh, uh, Simon uh, Shametsuri team, uh, where we show that affective touch uh, can modulate pain. So the fact of uh, touching someone else uh, where you care about and if you are empathetic with the, those person, uh, lower the pain of, of that person. And on top, this phenomenon of uh, uh, analgesia uh, induced by uh, affective touch is correlated to modulation of interbrain synchronization. So that was quite interesting, but from a scientific perspective also, what I, I found very important in these results is that uh, most of the people were either saying uh, initially some reviewer were even uh, questioning uh, the, the data and saying like, I don't believe that. And some other were like, well, that's obvious that it's synchronized because they are engaged 
in the similar task and it's rhythmic. So like at the motor level or at the language level, but actually in the case of affective touch, we are facing uh, a social interaction that is purely arrhythmic, which is very interesting because it shows that those phenomenon of interbrain synchronization are not just uh, a byproduct of mutual entrainment of brain activity. And well, historically interesting that in 2019, we have been also uh, lucky to see uh, interbrain synchronization assessed in animal models, so in, in rats and in, in bats, actually. And uh, that was quite uh, welcome because uh, despite the, the growing literature on interbrain synchrony in humans, a lot of people were still very full of doubt about uh, the existence of those interbrain synchronization. And well, in, in the case of those uh, animal studies, uh, and even more recently, I, I will men mention another one, uh, they have a very strong uh, causal claim on uh, interbrain synchronization, and the level of proof is well more accepted by the scientific community in general. So that was quite nice. Uh, then more recently also with uh, the team of uh, Ruth Feldman in Israel, we also uh, looked at other type of interaction. So like uh, comparing even in the same uh, dyads, uh, two different tasks of so motor coordination and empathy giving discussion. And we compared um, uh, romantic couples, uh, best friends and strangers to show our human attachment and those uh, more uh, ecological dimension of sociality can also modulate uh, those interbrain synchronization, which is like diffi more difficult to do in mice, but uh, possible in human. And so that, that promise for the, the next coming years, a uh, lot of interaction between those different levels of experimentation. And so if we summarize a bit this historical part, we have like really a, an explosion of studies uh, from the 1965 uh, parapsychology science paper to those days with like uh, 2019, the assessment of those interbrain synchronization in uh, animals. So now that was the history. Let's talk about a bit the hype as a uh, principle of fairness. Uh, so the hype is, well, there are a lot of stuff that have been published indeed uh, that may be uh, not that rigorous and uh, one of the reason is that if you plot the number of uh, sensor on the X axis and the number of interbrain synchronization uh, pairs of sensor connecting, well, it's, it's squared. So uh, you mean that you have even more uh, comparison when you're doing statistics and it's way more prone to uh, false positive. So in that case, you need to correct for multiple comparison and have proper statistical frameworks to avoid those false positive. And on top of that, uh, this, this paper by uh, Adrian Burgess uh, from 2013 also warned on the, the fact that there are a lot of spurious synchronization that can emerge in, in different uh, connectivity measures such as uh, phase locking value, for instance, uh, where the similar that are more the reflection of being engaged in the same task. So for instance, if you ask two people to close their eyes simultaneously in two different rooms, even if they are not communicating, the, the, their activity in their brain is going to be more similar because they are closing their eyes and have this huge increase of alpha activity in their two brains. And if you're not correcting properly in your design, then you're going to end up with like interbrain synchronization during uh, just closing eyes, which uh, doesn't make sense at the first th thing. But then you can see that if you take a bird eye view, and we recently published with uh, Meryl Fairhurst uh, a review of those different types of coupling and alignment, and including spurious alignment. Well, when you're measuring interbrain synchronization, you're measuring similarity between two systems, uh, whether it's at the behavioral, so the same task, the neurobiological, if they are like uh, with two brains alike, 
And also that's a, a next frontiers to, to me at the cultural level, because there are some work in cultural neuroscience showing how culture also modulate how the brain react in social cognition. And so in that case, it will affect the similarity. But the, the way you are similar at the neurobiological level, and now I'm working on, on psychiatry uh, and especially with uh, autism spectrum disorder, the, the, the diversity of your neurobiology affect your ability to communicate. And so the second part of the measurements that you are doing when you're doing interbrain synchronization is the communication of information, whether it's unidirectional and reciprocal. And so like from a methodological standpoint, you need to balance those different factor in your experimental design to be able to assess properly what this factor is doing in the measurements of interbrain synchrony. So is there a proper control condition would be also a, a third kind of uh, question for reviewer two uh, to, to make sure that what you're claiming as a correlate of interbrain synchronization in, at the behavioral level or the social level is really what you're doing or it, it's just like uh, a commonality at the neurobiological, behavioral or environmental level with shared noise, for instance. And so for uh, deciphering those things, you can do a in silico hyperscanning. So doing a simulation within a computer of two brains in interaction. Uh, we did that in 2012 uh, with replicating kind of uh, our results that were quite surprising initially with this interbrain synchrony. So having a, a model mathematically in silico was a way to probe the different factors that I'm talking about with the similarity and communication. And so here we are plotting the, the interbrain synchronization on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the flow of information that is exchanged between the two brains in the mathematical model. And what we showed is that even without information exchange, so here at zero, you have a residual synchronization of 0 0.25 with phase locking value, for instance, showing that Actually, if you're not recording two random number generator, you would still find interbrain synchronization that are just reflecting the similarity of the two system that you're uh, looking at. So if you record two brains, even without any exchange, so that's the example I was giving for the uh, Burgess and the, the fact of closing the eyes, the fact that you have more similarity between the two brains uh, give you this spurious residual synchronization. What's interesting is the difference between when you are exchanging actively information between the two brains and the resting uh, level when you're not exchanging information. So like you can assess with computational models like that or with proper empirical uh, design, uh, these differences that are meaningful from a, a psychologic uh, perspective. And so the, the final uh, question that you should <coughs> be asking yourself before a reviewer asks it to you is do you even need hyperscanning? Because a lot of things can be also probed from a, a single brain recording perspective. So for instance, uh, what I was showing with the intra-brain uh, correlates of agency, you can imagine to record two people interacting. So the, the design was more like the ecological way of having two people in interaction but you can still also record only one of the two brain. That's possible. And in that case, the claim that you're doing at the intra-brain level doesn't need the hyperscanning uh, component. So a lot of studies uh, should really go back to their hypothesis and check if hyperscanning is actually needed. So let's move to hope and be a, a more positive. So the hope are, uh, First, that we have a, a huge uh, progress at the technical level. So for, I was speaking about this frame by frame analysis of behavior that took like forever, like a, not, not forever, but 11 months during the PhD. It's kind of forever for some people. Um, but so now with the progress of computer vision and machine learning, uh, you can have semi-automated or fully automated analysis of behavior that quite facilitate uh, this uh, tedious part to focus on more like the, the interbrain analysis. So that's one hope. Uh, the other one is 
to go at the developmental level. So the work of uh, Victoria Leon or Sam West in Cambridge, for instance, or, or uh, St Stephanie Hill in Vienna are pretty uh, amazing on that perspective because they, they are showing how we can use those interbrain synchronization uh, as a measure of uh, uh, parent-infant uh, interaction. So that's the next frontier as well. And one that is even uh, more complicated is to scale it at the group level. So uh, my uh, friend colleague, uh, Susan Dicker, for instance, uh, managed to do uh, 12 uh, children simultaneously with the teacher during uh, uh, class. So she's there. Uh, and uh, they were showing how those uh, multi-brain recording uh, at the group level were a good way of uh, quantifying the level of joint attention and how during the class the students were synchronized with the teacher. And finally, a, a big challenge also for at the population recorded level is clinical population and uh, with uh, Suzanne Dicker again, uh, we are starting to do uh, both developmental and clinical recordings uh, using um, EEG as well. Uh, there have been pioneering work by Eda Bilek in fMRI also uh, about the, the clinical population in, and uh, I invite you to look it up. But um, beyond the population uh, aspect, uh, the, the future hope is also to go from a correlational aspect of those interbrain synchronization to a more causal and explanatory level. So understand what does interbrain synchronization mean and have they uh, functional meaning beyond just uh, being a, a quantitative assessment of the level of communication or similarity between two people. And so in that case, we recently uh, had a letter with uh, Quentin Moreau who is joining the lab soon about the different types of uh, causal assessment of interbrain synchronization. One of them would be uh, using hyperscanning, but tweaking it with cross-channel feedback, something that was already actually uh, described in the paper of Montague in 2002, uh, using hyper-neurofeedback or even brain-computer interface, like in this paper, uh, what I call tech telepathy. Uh, you can also uh, uh, play with the causal uh, relationship between behavior and uh, neurophysiology. Another way, and uh, we worked already with, on that uh, with uh, Quentin, uh, is the use of uh, um, human-machine interaction to structurally assess the causation of the self and other uh, integration of information. So for instance, in, in the case of a human avatar interaction, we were able to identify uh, the RTPJ, so the right temporal pipe junction that was a hub in the interbrain synchronization in multiple uh, studies as the, um, the brain area most responsible of uh, integrating information of self and other ongoing behavior. And finally, and I, I briefly spoke about that with the, the 2012 paper, uh, with even no brain recording, we can have mathematical model to test hypotheses uh, of the logical causality uh, at play uh, in the phenomenon of interbrain synchronization. So using a uh, simulation like that, where we have uh, two virtual brain in interaction in silico. And the ultimate uh, and final uh, frontiers, uh, which is interesting because uh, in the case of Max team being uh, uh, an EGI being uh, more related to the stimulation, is to go from this uh, uh, correlational analysis of interbrain synchronization to active perturbation of the system. And uh, for instance, like in this paper by Giacomo Novembre, how forcing in-phase or anti-phase uh, synchronization between two brains have consequences at the behavioral level and thus uh, really assessing causal relationship between IBS, interbrain synchronization and behavior. And so, Recently, like when I say recently, it was uh, three weeks ago. Uh, again, like the community of animal uh, models uh, catch up uh, with these topics with uh, a wonderful piece in Nature Neuroscience showing that when you have mice stimulated 
in optogenetics, either synchronize or desynchronize the two mice that are uh, stimulated in a synchrony fashion are more socially uh, active and interacting. So that's uh, quite straightforward and uh, impressive uh, causal demonstration. Of course, it remains to be uh, developed with other type of uh, control conditions. For instance, instead of focusing here, the two mice on the top were, intera uh, were stimulated at five hertz and the two mice at the bottom at uh, 25 hertz and five hertz. Uh, what I would be curious is to like in the study of uh, Giacomo Novembre uh, to play with in phase five hertz and anti phase five hertz as a control intermediate condition. So, well, uh, all that needs hardware, and uh, we, we published a, a methodics paper showing how to set up uh, your hyperscanning uh, lab, including uh, with EGI systems. And it needs also software. So we created a hyperscanning Python toolbox uh, in open source uh, that allowed to streamline analysis, pre-processing, statistics, and visualization of interbrain synchronization. So we're gonna do a little demo, this, like I'm good on the timing, to show you how it works, uh, especially uh, using uh, some data from EGI recording. So let's move to the demo and maybe if there are like burning question, I can also take them. I don't see in the chat or the question. No, so, okay, I move to the demo then. Hoping it will be, uh... so, okay, I have like a Python, uh, Terminal at the bottom here. Is it uh, readable? Yeah. Uh, okay. That's good. Great. So, well, uh, the usual, you're importing your traditional library for Python scientific toolkit. Then I'm uh, pretty uh, grateful that there is like a uh, a community called uh, MNE Python that developed a wonderful uh, toolkit for uh, EG and Meg. So my colleague uh, uh, Dennis Engman was a, a major help in, in the development of iPipe by being a, a friend and a, co a dedicated colleague to explain MNE and how we can plug on MNE Python. So I encourage people even without hyperscanning to check MNE Python for uh, data analysis of your of their EEG data. And then you can load different subsystems of iPipe. So here for today, because of the sake of time, I'm gonna talk more about uh, pre-processing, typical analysis and some visualization. So here we load that. Then something that I like to do is to have uh, my data folder as a variable so I can move quickly from uh, one computer and another the script without having to uh, change everything. So here I tidy everything in the data folder and you can have like some check about which data are available here. Here I used a, a little script that also show for instance here for this data set there is a warning explaining that there is no event code here. So for the sake of simplicity, I focused on the, uh, the number seven where we have both the baby and the mom recorded and there is like apparently uh, events. So using MNE Python, I can load those MFF files. So uh, max team uh, EGI uh, file and it's fully, uh, accessible directly from MNE in, even without iPipe. So once you have load that, and uh, it's important also to preload in the memory the data because uh, MNE also allow you to load only the metadata, but for what we're gonna do, it's important to load the data uh, entirely. Um, something that is very important for hyperscanning is to check 
the the events so here for instance we have uh, for the recording one uh, gene three gene four and gene five and then we have uh, like here for the second uh, gene two gene three so it's like not necessarily the same uh, events on both sides and actually uh, we can also check an important thing uh, the frequency of sampling so between the two recording so here you can uh, with our check that indeed the frequency sampling of subject one is similar to the uh, stamp frequency sampling of the participant two. When then we can extract the events, uh, check the the start of the recording for the two uh, the two recording. So it's like the clap that I was talking about, and then we can crop the two recording at the same start and duration, taking the duration as the minimum uh, length of the two. So we end up after that with uh, row one and row two as two recordings with the same length. And you can see that uh, something that can be confusing, it's not the same number of channels because the channel in row two contains other trigger. Um, so it, we are not even yet to IPipe. Uh, it's more like uh, Vanilla, MNE Python uh, things at that point. So we can filter the data to make them uh, easier to, to check. So here I'm, I'm just filtering uh, my two recordings and we can even plot them easily using MNE Python. Good on time. So the thing is that it takes time for the filtering, especially. Um, and then we have, let me explain the next step while it's doing the filtering. Yeah, we are extracting, uh, generating, sorry, uh, fixed length events that gonna be a uh, epochs. So the idea is to slice your true recording uh, in chunk of uh, one second duration. So you do that for participant one and participant two. You have to be careful to do it separately for row one and row two because uh, if you check the the timing of row one and the timing of row two, uh, it, here it's okay, good. But for the events, it can be uh, confusing. It, it doesn't need, it doesn't use necessarily the same starting uh, clock for events. So I advise to don't play with fire and use events one and events two separately. And then you can create your chunks. So in MNE it's called epochs. So you're taking your raw continuous recording. You're taking the events. I use 42 because I'm a nerd uh, as the event ID. And then you have like your uh, 365 chunk of one second. And you can even plot them like that. Oh. So you can see that here, let me diminish a bit. Uh, the scale so you can see the signals. So you have your one second chunks. And actually, even inside MNE, you can indicate, oh, this chunk looks good, while this chunk looks bad, right? Uh, but what we're going to do is to automatize that. So we first equalize the count. It's good. We're going to do using the, the pre-processing uh, part of IPipe uh, some ICA. Uh, correction. So here we are wrapping the ICA tools of MNE, uh, but um, you will see we are using a, a thing to uh, map one correction on one brain with the components of the other brain. 
So that's uh, that's not mandatory, but it's just to to show these uh, pre-processing steps. So it takes a bit time. Technically, going to show us a figure with the the different ICA components. And when it's done, we can choose which component we're going to clean in the participant one and participant two. Come on, computer. Yeah, and while that's while that's running, uh, do you have any advice for people that are uh, interested in learning Python and ME, uh, how they can get started? Sure. Well, uh, ME is really uh, it's really well maintained. They have a very large community, and uh, the from the installation of ME itself to uh, the tutorials and way to contribute. There are a lot of content. So they, they did an amazing job to explain, for instance, how to get started with different functionality, uh, how to work with sensor location, for instance, how to do uh, even FNIRS now. And so that's a cool stuff. We, we can have both FNIRS and EG now in ME. Uh, so strongly advise to check out the ME Python website, definitely. So it's a bit long. Ah, now it's starting to the other one. Um, if there are burning questions, is the right moment where it's calculating. <laughs> so don't be shy and don't hesitate to post your questions. Almost done. So here on top, we are doing that with only one recording on one pair of participants. So it can be quite long. And one advantage of using uh, m &E Python is that since it's in Python, you can uh, very easily uh, scale it uh, without paying so much uh, expensive extensions uh, on uh, uh, on clusters and so on uh, also uh, HPC so uh, high computing uh, facilities for instance here in Montreal we have uh, access to Beluga the, the supercomputer of Quebec so I, I do many Python uh, scripts for all the those time consuming pre processing on the supercomputer. Mm. Almost done. I think I'm going to switch quickly to the even shorter. I know I can't do shorter. That's strange. It takes so much time. Maybe Zoom is taking a lot of uh, computation power. We have a, a general question here. One, it's, uh, do you have any advice for researchers that are interested in the in this area of research, uh, but are fearful about the the practical complexities of recording two or more subjects? Uh, well, ah, yeah, this is, um, well, my advice would be to uh, uh, multiply the. Um, the synchronization devices between your recording because uh, it's indeed technically problematic, uh, but uh, the worst is that sometimes you have a, a desynchronization of the recording that can occur on one uh, system. So what I use, you've seen in the video, like for instance, LED uh, in front of camera is a very straightforward way of adding a, a, a flash, like a clap, Synchronized with the uh, TTL uh, five volt signal sent to also amplifiers, so you can have like this kind of 
uh, synchronization signal uh, sent to all the device. There is like now a lab stream layer, which is a library for synchronizing different stream of, of data. It's pretty convenient. But that would be like uh, one of big advice. Um, the other advice would be to uh, aim simple first, like uh, really uh, even try to, to do a basic check. Uh, even if it's, it sounds like uh, at first very too simple, like for instance, uh, taking two people uh, in the same room and make them uh, uh, interact uh, in a very noisy way so that you have syn synchronization of the artifacts is a good way of already seeing if it's uh, well synchronized at the recording level. Of course, you, don't, you should not do that for your end up experiment. Another way of checking your pipeline, so not at the recording level, but at the pipeline level, is to use recording of the same person at two different time or with a, a slight uh, shift uh, in time. So technically you are majorly synchronized with yourself. So uh, it's supposed to be a synchrony of one when there is no lag and progressively with time it should uh, vanish. And actually it's part of the, the analysis for the statistics to uh, compare uh, recording of pairs with virtual pairs where you, you, you take two different uh, participants at two different times to check if there is again in uh, interaction. So here is just like to show you can choose um, which ICA component you want to clean. And then there is another uh, pre-processing step that's pretty nice and uh, developed also by my colleague, uh, Dennis Engman, called auto-reject, which uh, take all the epochs that all the chunks of recordings uh, that you have separated and you uh, automatically interpolate bad electrodes or reject the world epochs if there is too much artifacts. So after the ICA correction is a, a good sanity check. And in iPipe, we did also a, a little wrapper of auto reject for uh, hyperscanning data where we can say we keep only uh, epochs where the two individuals have clean data or uh, we can say also if only one or the other uh, have uh, bad data we reject. So like uh, to fusion the, the pre-processing steps. And so that would be the last time consuming part. There you go. And once you have like your uh, pre-processed epochs, you can compute intra-brain stuff. So that's not really a hyperscanning thing, but still it's always cool to check uh, your spectrum for subject participant one, participant two. And what people are mostly interested in is you can combine the EG. So here it's important to pick only the EG channel because as I say, there is one that has more channels because there is other uh, triggers reported in the file. So it will crash if you don't take only the EG channels. So you take your data for participant one, participant two, you identify the frequency band of analysis, you compute the complex signal associated with. So for theta, it's problematic because we have one second, so it's maybe a bit too small, but we're gonna check alpha instead of theta. Then you compute uh, different me measurements. So like for instance, in the case of uh, Circular correlation, that's the one proposed by uh, Adrian Burgess, which is less prone to statistical bias. <coughs> you can unpack the interbrain synchronization in the different frequency band. And last but not least, you can do a, a little z score to have your value and final step visualization. So once you have that, you can plot either in 2D. Uh, the, for instance, up above three uh, Z-score uh, channels, uh, interbrain synchronization. So that's the 2D version. And we have even a 3D version 
in I5 that still is, uh, uh, we, are we are making some uh, adjustments. For instance, there are also measure of causality with uh, partial direct coherence, and we're gonna plan to have uh, little arrows to indicate the flow of causality between one brain and the other. But that, that's about that. So like, it's uh, just a little uh, demonstration of what's possible with uh, high pipe. And uh, you can check out the website. We have a documentation with all the, the functions. It's very simple to, to install. You can install iPipe. And for each uh, subsection of the API, we did a, a documentation with different variables and so on. So even within Python, you can use the L function, to, for instance, for the visualization. You can say, oh, I don't know how to use that. Do help. And we spend time to actually write all the documentation so to guide and ease the use of those tools. And uh, in the coming months, the plan would be to create more tutorials on the website and even video tutorials to guide uh, people in the use of uh, HiPipe. So that's for today. If there are like other questions, I'm more than happy to, to help. Uh, so yeah, I see one about EG Lab MATLAB. Uh, indeed, that's one of the next uh, tutorial that we're gonna do. So all the data that are pre-processed with EG Lab can be loaded in MNE Python. So there is even on the website of MNE Python already a tutorial to uh, manipulate EG Lab data. So here, instead of loading EGI data with the, the function that I show that load the MFF, you can store in MNE structure uh, a dot set EGLab file and do the rest of the step that I show. Uh, and if you have already preprocessed it in EGLab, then you don't need to do the ICA and, and preprocessing steps. So that's totally uh, possible, yeah. Are there other burning questions? If you don't have questions yet, but still want to reach me, uh, there is my email there. And also something that can be cool if you are in GitHub and uh, wanting to uh, ask questions about iPipe, uh, we have actually a GitHub repository with all the codes you can even change the code of iPipe. And if you are a developer, uh, we are searching people to help developing iPipe and maintaining it. So you can have a, a very easily uh, developing um, development environment using Poetry. And uh, you can post your questions, issue, suggestion of enhancement directly in the issue tab on the iPipe repo. So if you have like questions related to the science, maybe email is, is better. But if you have like very technical question about iPipe or enhancement suggestions, uh, please use the GitHub page so that it kind of create a, a knowledge database of all the bugs and uh, enhancements so we can collectively work on that. Thanks so much, Guillaume. That was a really great uh, kind of introduction to the to this field, and it's really impressive, kind of everything you've developed for this. Um, so, uh, so I'm back. That's the that's the beauty of open source. So, yeah, uh, I had like all those uh, wonderful people to work with, and the other joining. So, that's actually also what is great about open source software development is. Uh, the aim of iPipe is not only to propose a tool to facilitate analysis because uh, it goes also with uh, creating a community of practice and exchanging about what are the proper statistics to use, uh, what are the good visualization to do, etc. So please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, we are much happy to, to welcome people helping to build up iPipe. Oh, great. Thank you again. And 
if if people have have questions uh, for us on the hardware side of things about how to do this with their their maximum EGI systems, feel free to contact us. Uh, visit our website egi.com. Um, but otherwise, um, we'll we'll wrap up for today. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. Bye, everyone. Good.